tonight, the FTC says T-Mobile made hundreds of millions of dollars from bogus charges. Google acquires Songza, and Facebook catches more heat for that whole emotional manipulation research. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 120 for Tuesday, July 1st, 2014. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. The FTC filed a claim today that says T-Mobile has been hiding charges in phone bills for premium third-party texting services that weren't authorized by its customers. In a statement about the matter, the FTC says that T-Mobile has made hundreds of millions of dollars through these charges. So the premium texting fees that uh, they covered services that sent users messages uh, such as horoscopes, celebrity gossip, flirting tips... This is all according to the FTC. And that the services cost $9.99 per month, but that T-Mobile charged customers for them even after it was determined that the charges were fraudulent. Then T-Mobile would apparently keep about 40% of the charge and the rest would go to that texting service in a practice called cramming. In a phone conference, the FTC says it hopes its lawsuit forces T-Mobile to pay customers back for these fraudulent charges and push a ban on bill cramming throughout the industry. T-Mobile is not the first to be accused of this. The FTC isn't seeking a fine in this case, but a separate investigation by the FCC could result in a fine for T-Mobile. Google has purchased Songza, the music app that sets up human curated playlists based on moods and activities. Terms have not been officially disclosed, but uh, earlier this month, the New York Post reported that the deal could be worth uh, about $15 million. Songza won't be shutting down, though, at least not yet. Its team will be joining Google in New York City and helping with contextual recommendation features for Google Play and possibly even YouTube down the road. The National Security Agency has been authorized to intercept information concerning all but four countries, according to top-secret documents leaked by former NSA contractor Edward Snowden. Now, the four countries, Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, have a broad no-spying arrangement with the U.S. The group is known collectively as the Five Eyes. But a classified 2010 legal certification shows that the NSA has been given more authority than it was previously known, which allows it to intercept through U.S. companies, not just communications of its overseas targets, but communications about its targets. That's quite a bit more. Now, the NSA isn't necessarily targeting all of the countries or organizations identified in the certification, the affidavits and an accompanying exhibit, but it has been given the authority to do so. Civil liberties advocates say because of the wide spectrum of people who might be engaged in communication about foreign governments and entities and whose communications might be of interest to the U.S., the privacy implications are clearly troubling. Today, Recode published a screenshot uh, from Twitter that showed a set of items from a shopping app called Fancy that also include buy now buttons. So back in January, Recode also discovered a mock-up online. It was created by the same company, Fancy, that a source said was used to pitch Twitter on what an e-commerce partnership might look like. The buy now buttons that were shown today surfaced in Twitter's mobile app. They weren't functional, though, meaning... If you tapped on them, didn't do anything, you weren't able to buy these items. So is Twitter shopping finally right around the corner? Well, back in May, the company announced a deal that lets Amazon shoppers add a product to their online shopping cart via a tweet, but that doesn't allow a user to pay for a product directly from the tweet. So what does it all mean? Neither company is commenting on this latest development. Last December, Microsoft promised to expand its use of encryption for cloud services to protect them from criminals and hackers and governments also. Today, though, the company says both inbound and outbound mail on the Outlook.com service will use TLS encryption when sending and receiving from servers that also support TLS. Microsoft says it's worked with other email providers, including Deutsche Telekom, Yandex, and Mail.ru, to ensure mail sent to and from these providers is encrypted while it's in transit. Outlook.com and OneDrive have also been updated to use Perfect Forward Security, or PFS. In PFS, the keys used for each connection are randomly generated on a per-session basis, which then protects against bulk data collection. 
Coming up, it's been 35 years since Sony introduced the Walkman, and we have come very far. But first, let's get joined by Anthony Highs, a writer over at TechCrunch. Hey, Anthony. Hey, how's it going? Well, it's going very well, thank you. So we decided we wanted to talk to you about Facebook today. So the story, uh, article in Forbes today, that Facebook has added the term research to a user agreement four months after an emotion manipulation study that has a lot of people really up in arms. So bring us up to speed on what actually happened here. Right. So as I understand it, this was back in 2012. Um, they basically did a study to show to sort of look at if you see really positive stuff, does that make you post more positive stuff? And if you see more negative stuff, um, do you post more negative stuff? Um, I think from what I understand, the the results were, you know, basically yes. Um, but the, you know, they published the study recently that came out, people were kind of angry about that. And then today, as, as you said, um, it also came out that, you know, if you look at the user agreement now, Facebook has said, you know, like, look, you know, if you, or at least people who are defending Facebook say, if you look at the user agreement now, it says, yeah, we can use your data for research. But it turns out actually that part of the agreement didn't get added until after the study was conducted. So, okay, let's, I guess the first, <laughs> the first question is, how do you feel about the idea that Facebook wants to figure out if we can, if, if it can lead us into a certain emotional state? Uh, I think definitely if you uh, look at it sort of, I guess, very, in a very sort of 10,000 feet view, it is slightly alarming. Like, oh, I don't really like the idea of people at Facebook citing, okay, this is the mood we want these people to be in. Um, I think, you know, on, on sort of the really small level that they were doing it at, I think it's, it's hard to get too worked up where it was really okay, we're going to show you a little bit more happy stuff. We're going to show you a little bit more more sad stuff. Um, I, I'm not enormously alarmed or depressed about that. What about the idea that uh, the idea that this was a research experiment was added after the fact? Does that change the experiment at all to you? Or is this kind of just a case of semantics? Uh, well, I think a lot of people, I think this is getting into a very sort of gray area here um, in terms of like, it's hard to say sort of definitively, at least for somebody who's not a professional researcher, you know, what is and isn't appropriate. I do think my my sense is that, you know, that the, the, there's sort of this spectrum, right, of what constitutes research. And, you know, a lot of people have sort of compared this to say, you know, like a lot of startups, you know, when you, when you use their website, they're doing A-B testing. You're going to see one version, you're going to see another version. They'll go with the version that people like the most. Um, and so the argue, one of the arguments, and, and one that I, I would par at least partially agree with, is that this, this is not that different. It's just let's, let's try out different things and see how people respond. Um, is that, you know, it's not necessarily this sort of very, like, secret into, uh, academic research. It's more like, hey, let's, it's like user testing, essentially. Um, and I think people, other people are saying that that's not exactly, it's not the same as A-B testing. It's a little bit, because, again, because there's the negative emotions involved. But I don't think it's, I think it's, it's kind of the same thing still. That, you know, it's different, but it's not that different. You also see ads on Facebook based on right. search history, uh, things that you've clicked on before, Facebook pages that you like. I'm wondering how, how different this is. I mean, besides the fact that if you are in a, maybe a negative emotional state, you can outwardly not right. let anybody know that. So it's, it's all, it's kind of under wraps. But right. it sort of seems like the same thing to me. Yeah, I think, in, in, again, it's, it is sort of a, a spectrum. And, and I think, you know, again, part of the maybe the, the criticism would be that what Facebook has gotten us accustomed to doing is to sort of share more and more and they use the data in more and more ways. So maybe there's not one day where, you know, they do something that's dramatically different or dramatically worse, but we just sort of become more and more accustomed to things that maybe we would not have been OK with a few years ago. Um, but I think you're right that, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it, it's not that different from what it does not feel that different to me compared to what Facebook has done in the past. I do think, to be honest, part of the reason people got upset is just because it's called, like, the, the name of the study is um, Evidence of Massive Scale Emotional Contagion Through Social Networks, which I feel like if you, if you just hear those words, it makes you think, oh, man, that's, a, what, did they, like, give me, like, an emotional disease on Facebook? And they did that as part of an experiment. And I, I think some of the response is just sort of this knee-jerk, not to say that people don't understand the experiment, but just that, you know, there's a lot of things about it that sort of hit, you know, sort of strike people the wrong way without necessarily being a hu hugely problematic in and of themselves. Also, anybody who's 13 or older can legally start a Facebook account, right? So do we have an issue of minors being emotionally right. manipulated as well? I think I think that's part of it is it, it has come out. Um, and again, it's, it's one of those things where I think it's because I don't think Facebook necessarily expected this response that the information has kind of come out kind of slowly. But one of the things they have admitted is that 
they they did not sort of emotion uh, not emotionally age you know there wasn't sort of an age gate so there were people in or there at least potentially could have been people um, you know who were under eighteen who were exposed to the same experiment. So if 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 you've got minors potentially uh, being tested for emotional distress <laughs> and people are upset about it. What's the next step here? Is 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 this just the it, it, we're we're in an age where if a company is profitable from tracking users, harvesting data, and then being able to sell ads back to its users, is this the future? Will we see lawsuits? Is this something that Facebook is going to uh, really regret when it has to change its privacy uh, terms of service again, as it has in the past because of a, a user uprising? Uh, I mean, my gut instinct is that, like a lot of other Facebook things, it's something that people will discuss. And certainly, um, I think I don't. I don't think Facebook is really thrilled with how they've handled this. But I don't think that you know it's necessarily going to make a huge difference either. I'm not going to say that there will or won't be lawsuits because uh, I have no idea. But um, I, I do think that uh, you know, again, it's, it's something that most of us uh, are are used to. Um, and so, I mean. I guess the worst case scenario for for Facebook, or, or and the best case scenario maybe for people who are concerned about this, is that you know maybe some some lawmakers become concerned and, and maybe step in, which you know they have in the past. I think some agencies have told Facebook, you know, you, you do need to be more transparent about what you're doing in people's data, and maybe we, you know we could see another situation like that here. Well, it sounds like uh, very recently uh, today, uh, Bloomberg wrote up a story that Facebook's news feed experiment that we're talking about now is is getting looked at by UK regulators. Doesn't mean anything's going to come out of it, but it definitely seems like it's ruffled enough feathers that that uh, people who are in charge of these things uh, want to take a closer look at what's going on to their citizens. Right. And I do think that gets to another point, which is that, you know, Facebook, like a lot of these internet companies, it's an international company now too. So even if U.S. regulators might be okay with this. That might not be the same in Europe or in another country. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Anthony Ha, for shining a little bit more light on what's going on, why people are upset, and why it may or may not be such a big deal. Anthony writes over at TechCrunch and uh, let people know where they can get a hold of you and read more of your work. Uh, yeah, just TechCrunch.com. You'll find my coverage, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Anthony Ha, one word. All right, Thanks Anthony. Stay, uh, stay cool out in New York City. All right, I'll try. All right. Okay, finally, well, I, we already told you that it's 35 years old. That's pretty old. The Sony Walkman, the first of Sony's portable cassette tape players, went on sale on this very day, July 1st, back in, can you do the math, 1979 for $150. I think I got my first one for Christmas in like 82 or something. The Walkman went on to become one of Sony's most successful brands of all time. And it had a variety of formats over the years. CD, mini-disc, MP3, and now streaming music. Over 400 million Walkman portable music players have been sold over its lifetime. 200 million of them were cassette players. Sony retired the cassette tape Walkman line back in 2010. Can you believe it lasted that long? And they were also forced to pay a settlement to the original inventor of the portable cassette player, Andreas Pavel. The name still lives on, though, in new MP3 players and Sony's Walkman app. And that is it. For this edition of Tech News Tonight, you can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can also watch Tech News Today. That is our morning version of a newscast tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.